80. <laughs> Uh, but uh, welcome from uh, the, let's see, hold on. Thank you. The Baltimore Architecture Foundation and um, Baltimore Heritage. Um, thank you for contributing today. We uh, have used these virtual histories to help supplement our um, program uh, funding um, because of the pandemic, which had been limited. And uh, we have a couple of upcoming um, events I wanted to make sure you were aware of. Baltimore Heritage is having their annual um, awards banquet and volunteer appreciation night, which is on October 13th. And um, ba uh, Baltimore Architecture Foundation and the AIA is having their annual uh, Excellence in Design Awards, which is happening on the 14th. So a lot happening in October. And then our next virtual history will be on Friday, October 21st, and we'll be discussing the evolution of the Windy Gates Estate, which is also in Baltimore County, um, which has some Olmstead Gardens, um, which still can be seen. And we had a actually walking tour on it as part of Doors Open Baltimore just last month. But today's talk that we're giving is on Idlewild, which is a Baltimore commu um, County community um, that uh, we have two wonderful speakers that are going to be presenting. We have Paul Romney, who's a longtime resident of the Idlewild community, serves as its newsletter editor and secretary of the Community Association. And he's a professional historian serving, uh, specializing in the history of Canada. And then we also have Brian Fisher, who is an AIA member, um, and a historic preservation uh, specialist. And AIA, I'm saying that too fast, is American Institute of Architects, so he's a registered architect. Um, he has contributed significantly to numerous um, important architectural projects, including works for the US Capitol, the National Archives, the Smithsonian Institution, and dozens of National Park Service sites throughout the US. So, um, he, and he's gonna be able to actually give us a little bit about the architectural styles you find in the community, and he also has a home there. So I am going to turn it over first to Paul, and then it will be Brian, and then at the end, we'll take your question and answers. And so you can put that question and answer in the question and answer box, and we can see it and get to those at the end. Thank you so much. Oh, and I am sorry, I never introduced myself. <laughs> I'm Jillian Storms. I'm currently on the executive board of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. And um, I turn it over to you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. And thanks to all for this opportunity to present on the hidden jewel of South Towson. Next. Idlewild is a community of 700, mainly single family homes on the Baltimore City County line. York Road is about half a mile to the west and Loch Raven Boulevard runs close to the eastern edge. From the city, Idlewild is approached along an arterial road, the Alameda, which I've colored in ochre. As it crosses into the county, the Alameda becomes Sherwood Road, and it soon peters out into a dead end. Next. Most of Idlewild stands on part of a farm or estate once owned by Joshua Register. In a historical sketch put out by the Community Association in 1989, Register figures as a benign Christian patriarch in spiritual rapport with the aspirations of the enslaved and as the founder of a community that inherited his vision. The author based this image mainly on the belief that Register called his estate Beulah Land, and she quotes a hymn about being safe in Beulah Land. Actually, though, its name was just Beulah. This fits Register's Welsh Methodist background, but it doesn't necessarily signal empathy with the enslaved, and Register didn't found idle wild anyway. He died in 1906. Five years later, Beulah was sold to a company run by the developer Harry E. Gilbert. The first Idlewild plat is dated 1913. Later that year, the land was conveyed to Idlewild Realty Company, 
another Gilbert vehicle, perhaps set up specially to handle the project. In 1922, Idlewild Realty sold the development to City Co Realty. Next. The 1989 booklet also links the name Idlewild to a hymn. One of our early and enduring landmarks is the United Methodist Church, said to have been built with materials and talents provided by volunteer community members. And the name Idlewild was thought to have been derived by a, from a passage in their hymn book, There's a Little Brown Church in the Wildwood. But perhaps we should be asking whether that song was in Harry Gilbert's hymn book since Gilbert was Idlewild's founder and namer, and Idlewild certainly expressed his vision. And one thing we know for sure about his vision is that Idlewild was not for black people. Each property deed carried a restrictive covenant barring blacks from ownership or rental, or even from living there at all, except as servants. As it happens, back in 1881, Joshua Register and his wife had deeded a plot of land to the trustees of the Beulah Methodist Protestant Colored Church. The church appears in the Baltimore County Atlases of 1898 and 1915, but it's gone by 1925. The colored church disappeared just as the white Methodist church was rising. Next, please. Idlewild predates its Western neighbors, Ansley and Stoneley, by a decade, but its development followed a different pattern. Ansley and Stoneley are homogeneous. In Ansley's case, what you see today pretty much conforms to the original plat. Idlewild, however, developed by a complex process of accretion, disintegration, and partial reintegration. Next. The complexity is visible on this map of Idlewild today, which is color coded into no less than, no fewer than seven distinct areas. The three green areas are all on the original plat. Two shaped, the two shades of purple at the west end show additional pur purchases in 1915 and 1924. The pink and yellow patches at the bottom became part of Idlewild because they lay between the original Idlewild and the city limit. This was extended northward in 1918 to a line that touched the original Idlewild without encroaching on it. There's also an eighth area, which isn't color coded. That's Glendale up in the Northeast corner. It was on the 1913 plat, but never developed as part of Idlewild. Today, you can step between Idlewild and Glendale, and Glendale across Herring Run, but there's no direct road access. Is the 1913 plat for the sake of comparison. I've marked the course of Herring Run in blue. An interesting feature tracking the west side of Herring Run is what's called Line of New Electric Railroad. The railroad never materialized, and that may be one reason that Glendale was never developed as part of Idlewild, though it's not the whole story. Next. Let's go back to today's map and see how Idlewild developed up to 1929. In 1915, Idlewild Realty bought the eastern end of the Ansley estate, that's the paler purple patch. Then in January 1924, Co Realty added the tract to the south of it. I'm pretty sure the 1924 purchase was made to secure access out to, to York Road via Walker Avenue, which forms the short diagonal boundary at the southwest corner. Note also Limit Avenue, 
right at the bottom of the map below the red boundary line. It's a city street and the homes on the south side belong to the city neighborhood of Idle Wood. Those on the north side were built in the 1950s as part of the same row house development as Idle Wood, but they're in the county, and so they became part of Idle Wild as well. Next. Now let's take a look at Idle Wild in 1929. Most of it appears on a page of the Sanford Fire Insurance Atlas, and I've imposed the I've superimposed the Sanford plate on my present day map. Nothing outside the plate was standing in 1929 except for the few houses colored in blue. There are two main sectors of development, one associated with Idlewild Realty and the other with Citico Realty. From about 1915 to 1922, Idlewild Realty was running a shuttle car along Register Avenue between York Road and the New Church. That fostered development along the, Idle, uh, along the Register Avenue corridor. But once CityCo takes over, the focus shifts southward. The shuttle car disappears. The road link to Walker Avenue is established. By 1929, development is heavily weighted to the 1924 acquisition and its environment. Next. The two sectors are distinctly different in style. The 1924 purchase is basically a shallow dell formed by a tributary of Chinkapin Run. City Co's boss said at the time that he was intending to construct small cottages and bungalows at moderate prices. The development there fits that description. There are more small cottages along Overbrook Avenue east of Sherwood, along with somewhat larger Dutch colonial revival bungalows. On the higher ground to the north, the register corridor features larger houses, larger lots, and a more eclectic range of styles. Next. Despite City Co's early emphasis on modest abodes in the southwest, the country didn't the company didn't give up on the North and Northeast. Here's what I call their Roaring Twenties vision for that sector. In December 1928, Citico wrote to the Olmsted Brothers, landscape, architect, landscape architects celebrated for the design of upscale suburbs featuring landscaped parkways. A preeminent local example, of course, is Roland Park. Citico wanted a street layout with the ravines and rolling landscapes of Idlewild north of Register Avenue. And presumably they weren't planning to put up small cottages there. Maybe they were responding to the Stonely development next door, where you were required to spend at least $3,000 on home construction. However, the scheme fizzled. The tract of land directly east of Idlewild was bought by the Roland Park Company, and City Co. called a halt until their new neighbors' plans became clear, and then the Roaring Twenties came to a sudden, nasty end. As a result, I'm sorry to say that the plans archived as Boomstead Brothers Job 9033 uh, contains no Oomstead input at all. They're all, they're all city co productions. However, they're very useful for idle wild history since they include this roaring 20s blueprint from 1926. Next. And this is the sadly reduced conception that replaced the roaring 20s vision in 1939. The whole northern sector along the Idlewild Ravine as far as Herring Run was given over to Maxalia Nurseries. At the east end, 
A sand pit or quarry was planted beside Herring Run. And across Herring Run, there's a big blank where Glendale would one day appear. For a while, the quarry in particular had an adverse effect on the ambience of Idlewild and its Western neighbors. At first, the only way out was to York Road along Register or Overbrook Road. In 1939, Idlewild and Ansley residents lobbied the county commissioners for a bridge over Herring Run and a road out to the northeast. As far as I know, that never happened. Certainly, quarry-related traffic remained a problem at least into the 1970s. Eventually, the quarry closed, however, and for the last 20 years, it's been the site of Overlook Park. Which, com which combines recreation facilities with a fair amount of wildland along Herring Run. And in the 1950s, the part of Maxelia Nurseries west of Sherwood Road became the distinctive residential development called Maxelia. Next. Because of this, much of, Idlewild, much of Idlewild nowadays has a certain bucolic charm. We don't have Olmsted style parkways, but we do have a parkway road, which dead ends where it was meant to intersect with a parkway. Along Idlewild Ravine in particular, the neighborhood has an almost rural While City Co's approach to Olmsted, the Olmsted brothers yielded nothing, Idlewild turns out to have an unexpected historical link to Frederick Law Olmsted Senior. In 1936, a vacant lot on Register Avenue was purchased by a controversial figure, Broadus Mitchell. Mitchell was a crusader for, reach, uh, for racial equality and an outspoken opponent of lynching. He was a man to whom black lives mattered. Two years previously, he'd run for governor of Maryland as a socialist. I don't know what Idlewild thought about socialism or racial equality for that matter, though I think I can guess. But Mitchell managed to offend his new neighbors by erecting what they called a mail order shack or shore house, which they said had been put up in a day. The Mitchell's practice of hanging out the wash on Sunday also gave offense. The neighbors complained about the shack to the county commissioners, perhaps hoping to get rid of the wash too. However, after exhaustive investigation, the commissioners concluded they could do nothing. But what's this got to do with Frederick Olmsted? Next. Well, Mitchell taught political economy at Johns Hopkins, and in 1924, he had published a book entitled Frederick Law Olmsted, a critic of the Old South. The book is partly based on correspondence made available by Frederick Olmsted Jr. And it's mainly devoted to Olmsted's criticism of the ethics and economics of slavery. However, it also includes a substantial and sprightly biographical sketch, including a synopsis of young Frederick's sex life. And that's Idlewild's connection with Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. Idlewild's development was largely completed in the 1940s and 50s as part of that era's suburbanization trend. In the 1950s, suburbanization finally brought the city of Baltimore to Idlewild's door, and along with suburbanization came the automobile. Being at the end of the Alameda, Idlewild was especially vulnerable. In the early 1960s, the county widened Sherwood Road as far north as Register Avenue. During the next 10 or 12 years, the community fought off three proposed developments at 
the south end of Sherwood Road, all related to the onset of commuter traffic. But the biggest threat of all was the county's plan to extend Sherwood Road north to Towson. Next. Here's a contemporary sketch map of the scheme. North of Stevenson Lane and the golf course, the extension runs along the Towson branch of Herring Run and joins Jopper Road at the site of the currently controversial Red Maple Housing Project. Next. But my sketch map comes from this announcement of a protest meeting at Idlewild Community Hall. And the handwriting at the top records that more than 500 people filled the hall to standing room only. It was 1975, a time of fixing things locally as well as nationally. The extension was promoted by the administration of Dale Anderson, who was Spiro Agnew's equally corrupt successor as Baltimore County Executive. But Anderson was now in jail, and a reformer, the late Ted Benetoulis, was in office. And so citizen power prevailed in Idlewild once again, and after that the threat of the automobile stabilized. In the 1990s, a community campaign to improve the business block on Sherwood Road included traffic calming bump outs that mitigated the harm caused by the widening 30 years early. Next. Today, Idlewild is a magnet for families willing to pay a premium for modest, mature housing stock in a desirable public school district. This has had consequences for the housing stock, since young middle-class families investing in modest, mature housing stock is a recipe for radical alteration of the original structure. Since the days of Harry E. Gilbert and Broadus Mitchell, there's also been a radical change in the community's social outlook. In the summer of 2020, a forest of Black Lives Matter and Biden-Harris lawn signs bore witness to that. But I'm not sure what we do about that shack. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, that was great. So again, I'm Brian Fisher and I'm an architect and I, I live in Idlewild. I've lived there for over six years now and it's a great place to live. And one of the things that's great about the neighborhood is we have a really eclectic mix of housing styles. Uh, and I'm gonna just go over the main styles that exist in the neighborhood. There are some one-off houses that are of different styles that some of which came before the platting of the neighborhood in 1913, and some of which have been infilled over the years. Uh, but I'm gonna sort of focus on the main styles that were built between the early 1900s, around the time the initial platting occurred in 1913, up to about the 1960s, which was when the neighborhood was basically built out. There have been a few in, infill houses here and there that have been built since then, but for the most part, uh, it was what you saw by the 60s was kind of what you have today. Next slide, please. So the earliest style that we see after the 1913 and leading up to the 1913 platting is the American four square. And this is a style of house that you see commonly around the Baltimore area and around the whole country actually. And they were sort of a predecessor to Victorian houses, which were built up until the late 1800s prior, but unlike Victorians, they're a much simpler house. They're much less ornate. They were appealing because they were less expensive to build. They could be built economically. 
but still offered a lot of space inside. Um, many four squares were kit houses, and a kit house was a house where you would order pre-cut lumber and other building materials. They would be shipped to the customer's building lot, and they would be assembled on site either by the homeowner or more commonly, they were actually assembled by a contractor. I think there's a misconception that a kit house was always built by the homeowner. And in fact, most of them would, would have been built by a number of contractors who would have probably been working with the realty companies that were in play at various stages in the development of this and other neighborhoods. Um, and certainly not all four square houses were kit houses, but it was pretty common for them to be constructed that way. Next slide, please. The next style, and this is probably a little bit more prevalent as this style became sort of more popular in the 1910s to the 1930s, which was one of the periods when construction was uh, the heaviest in sort of the southern sections of Idlewild, as Paul discussed. Uh, we see the American bungalow come into prominence in the neighborhood. There's several different variations that you can see in the photos here. The one on the left is a Dutch colonial style variation of a bungalow. And then you see some other variants on the right. Um, they're typically a two story house with the second story built beneath the sloped roof. So we see that quality here. They usually have generously sized porches and a lot of overhanging beams and rafters, projecting eaves and dormers on top of their roofs, which most of the houses here, again, have dormers projecting from the roofs. Um, these houses are also often referred to as American craftsman houses. And that name was derived from a magazine called The Craftsman, which was a magazine that promoted arts and crafts design in the early 1900s. So it kind of promoted this design aesthetic that we see with these houses. And then the popularity of this style really exploded um, as a growing middle class sort of wanted to escape urban environments. And this style of house was perceived as a having a greater connection with nature um, than some of the urban housing that was common at the time. So you see these houses again, sort of all over well, the Baltimore area and all over the country. These were also commonly built as kit houses or from catalog plans. So you'd buy a, a catalog that had a bunch of house plans and you could build your house from that or your contractor could do it or again you could build it by buying a kit. Um, some of these kits did come from Sears and Sears eventually picked up that craftsman name and used it to advertise these houses and advertise a line of tools that they carried for a long time but there were also a number of other companies in the early 1900s that were selling this style of houses as kits. There's almost an unlimited number of variants that you can see, many of them in Idlewild, but uh, just around the area too, you can see all the variations. So if we go to the next slide, there was really a slowdown in development during the Great Depression. So after about 1929, we don't really see much being built again until after World War II. And when building does pick up in the neighborhood again in the 1940s, the style that is that becomes predominant is the Cape Cod. The Cape Cod has a lot in common with the bungalow style, but it's sort of a more simplistic style in that basically it has sort of a rectangular first floor, a pitched roof and then dormer dormers projecting from the upper story roof. So it's sort of a little bit more stripped down and simplified version of a bungalow style. Um, 
Cape Cod style originated on Cape Cod in New England as early as the late 1600s. And different versions of capes became popular on the East Coast. Um, their sort of simplistic form and their roof lines made, the, made them pretty easy to build and economical to replicate. And they were also seen as being relatively inexpensive to maintain because they didn't have the projections and the porches and the sort of the more ornate woodwork that some of the older houses had. So they gained huge popularity again in Idlewild, there's a number of them, but there's also a number of them around the East Coast of the United States. Many of them also were sold as kit homes, although that trend started to decline after the uh, post-war era, and you would see more of these being built by real estate developers for resale. And there's probably a mix of these types in Idle, Idlewild. Um, certainly when you have a row of them that are sort of all identical or sort of all variations on a theme, those are probably more likely to be built by a developer, stick built by a developer. If we go to the next slide. Um, Colonial Revival was another style that was popular around the 40s to the 60s. Um, there's examples of these. There's not as many examples of these as there are of the Cape Cods and the bungalow style houses, but there are pockets of them, particularly on the north side of Register, along Litchfield, in the Sherwood area. Um, colonial architecture was popularized during the American colonial era leading up to the Revolutionary War and people sort of nostalgic for that time period after World War II and sort of wanting a place to call home uh, thought this style was appealing and sort of recalling that time era, era. and again these houses share in common with the Cape Cod that they, you know, sort of simplistic. They're just a rectangle with a, a sloped roof. So they have that appeal of being sort of easy to maintain, easy to construct. And so that led to a lot of them being built during that time period as well. Next slide. There we go. Um, then during the 1950s, and into the 60s, we see a little bit of a shift in the, the styles that are being developed in Idlewild, and in particular, north of Register Avenue on some of the larger lots. Um, we see ranch houses being built. Ranch houses are characterized by asymmetrical layouts and long single-story profiles. They have shallow pitched roofs and usually have deep overhangs. Uh, they often have open floor plans, which was sort of a new concept that was coming into style in the 50s and 60s. And it wasn't as common in the older style houses in Idlewild. And they have a lot of features that the older houses wouldn't have had, such as attached garages, sliding glass patio doors, forced air heating cooling even perhaps that wouldn't have been common in the older houses. So there was sort of a, a revolution in the way houses were, the you know, features that houses had to appeal to the buyer at that time. And um, the ranch sort of filled that need during that era. And then the next slide is the mid-century modern houses. And these were built Really, in the same time period as the ranches during the 50s and 60s, they share a lot of the same characteristics. They hark hearken to the works of architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, who um, wanted a house that they viewed as sort of connecting with nature by being sort of low slung and very, very horizontal and low to the ground, and sort of following the landscape. And 
and you can see that a little bit in some of the examples here. There are a couple of variations on that too, where about to have some of the lower right it has a slight bit of a Spanish colonial influence to it, but it also has the kind of the characteristics of a mid century modern and it seems sort of low swung and often, but always always having a flat roof or a very low pitched roof. Um, I don't believe any of these were designed by sort of, sort of the big name architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, but certainly the influences of that design era were in play. And many people who wanted sort of a custom home at that time would have built a house in this style. And then over the Magdalena area that Paul talked about, many of the houses there were built in sort of mid century modern style, being that they were constructed at the very, very end of the quite a while development era, sort of in the late 50s to the 60s. So, so the next slide, I think that it basically in some our army museum styles and certainly certain styles of color as well as the very eclectic mix that we have in the next steps in the thing that makes makes it related to sort of some of the unique and appealing to people people who choose to live here. So I noticed it looked like there was only one. Oh, there are a couple questions. Okay, good. We have um, my family moved to a new house in a registered avenue in 1950. 1950, uh, although she doesn't have a question. Um, and um, yeah, so we were having a little bit of sound problems, Brian. I don't know, it wasn't coming across. I'm hoping by not sharing my screen somehow that might help something bandwidth wise. Um, I had some questions, so be sure people to put questions in the chat. Um, uh, I was kind of curious. I'm an architect myself, and uh, I've always wondered if having a porch on the front where people can sit, which was often done back in the period of time when there was no air conditioning, that's how you cooled off in the evening and such, um, is it different those areas in the neighborhood that have that versus those that are, you know, have really no frontage to them that is between the street and them is is do you perceive more neighborliness or is or does that does the architecture not at all form any kind of street interaction just curious i know people make the difference but i'm still curious does the architecture make the difference at all that was a question for you, Brian, or Ball. Yeah, sure, sure. I think people certainly receive uh, having porches that are in the front of the house and having houses that are in the front of the house. Do you see that in the space? Do you see that in the middle of 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 the middle Something that they're incorporating into. So, Brian, you are yeah. still coming, Britt, you're still coming broken up. And I don't know if getting on again and getting off would allow you to, but um, right now you are coming up broken up. And I don't know why I'm hearing it. Um, but I have another question. Um, so, are there any current, and Paul, you could answer this one, are there any current architectural controls for the neighborhood? Is there anything that stops a person from, other than zoning, tearing down and building new, bigger, uh, differently, whatever? Well, I, I can't uh, speak from authority, but that's tending not to happen. What's tending to happen? Well, I mean, so some of the uh, some of the smallest cottages in particular from the 1920s have shown a distinct tendency to uh, sprout second floors and double in size. Um, so they look completely different um, than, than, than they did originally, um, but it's not the same as totally tearing them down to the ground and building something much bigger on top. We have another uh, question from um, audience is, I grew up on Walker Avenue and I'm wondering how the area known as 
Idle Wood got its name. Do you happen to know that? I have no idea. I, I can only imagine that, uh, I mean, I, I have no idea. Um, it, it can't be a total coincidence that it uh, it's right next to Idlewild, right across the road from Idlewild, virtually, and 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 and, and sounds so similar. But, but I don't know how it was uh, how that name was chosen. What's interesting is that um, businesses on the Sherwood Road tended to adopt. Um, city nomenclature. Um, for instance, I used to get my hair cut up in Idlewild at the Idlewood Barbershop. Um, and, and often in the 1960s, uh, you find uh, the businesses on Sherwood Road referring to themselves as being on the Alameda. So something that was, say, at 6310 Sherwood Road. Um, uh, it advertises itself as being at 6310 the Alameda, um, but that's a digression. <laughs> and let's see, um, I don't see any more questions. Hang on. Oh, oh there are more. Sorry, I didn't add. Okay. Um, where was brought his uh, Mitchell shack? Uh, uh, yeah, where was his shack? <laughs> well, it was at uh, one ten oh eight register. It doesn't it doesn't look much like it used to. I understand, and uh, I mean it, it was its its footprint is now much bigger. It's still low rise, but it's much bigger. Okay. Um, Paul mentioned that the Red Maple Place development at some point in this presentation, what's the relationship between the development and the Idlewild community? Nothing at all, except that they are both on Herring Run. And, uh, and, and the uh, extension of Sherwood Road would have gone up Herring Run to, uh, to, to that particular part of Joppa Road. And two more questions, and then and then we'll give it a pass. I mean, we'll finish up. I noticed the last slide of the garage is built below ground. Can you tell me more? That must be to Brian. Sure. Hopefully, my audio is better now. I did yes, drop off is. and come back. Okay. Much better. Great. Um, I think some of it just has to do with the topography of the neighborhood, particularly in the northern section it's very hilly so uh, trying to negotiate those hills and sort of keep a, a house plan that has a livable sort of main floor maybe that was it was done that way to make that work better and um alex asks i think paul mentioned that idle well uh, deeds have racial covenants. How do we find out if our specific deed has that? And if it does, how do we remove it? Uh, well, um, the deeds the deeds are recorded in the uh, I think it's the circuit court records of Baltimore County of Baltimore of Baltimore County, and one can uh, trace them back. Um, it's probably easier done by contacting me and, uh, than, than me uh, telling, uh, text, uh, trying to, you know, sort of uh, mumble what mumble the uh, the process over over the uh, over the air here. Um, so by all means, get in touch with me, and uh, and I'll tell you how it's done. Yes, we have another person who wanted to know if there's a way to research past owners, specifically original owners of their homes. So it sounds like that you have some neighborhood um, neighbors who would like to tap into your extensive knowledge. So um, I'm sure there'll be follow up after this talk. Very and, good. And uh, I do want to I do want to say that the reason why originally I looked at Ottawa, what, how many years old now is the neighborhood from its start? Well, theoretically, I suppose 109. 109. So um, 
I had been looking through, I, I also am on the Friends of Maryland Olmsted Parks and Landscapes Board, and I had been looking through and saw that there was that project file, and then tried to figure out what exactly, you know, was done, and then learn uh, by meeting you and, and, and talking that, that actually nothing got to be materialized, but it's still wonderful that that material is currently... Um, the National Park Service, which owns all their archives, has put a lot of that on Flickr, they have digitized. So, um, and, and the Friends of Maryland Olmsted Parks and Landscapes also has their annual meeting, which is the same night as the Baltimore Heritage, he gets. Um, but we are sort of featuring all the other neighborhoods and parks and such that um, we now have access to a lot of those drawings and um, are creating a big master list. And so it was, it was wonderful to discover your neighborhood by, you know, that sort of behind the scenes method, um, because it does have such wonderful topography and such and so different in parts and pieces because it came up out at different points. Um, so it, it sort of unique that way. Um, is there any final words either of you want to say? I think uh, this has been really lovely to learn about. Oh, I have pretty much said what I have to say. Do, do you have any annual events or, or celebrations um, that the public ever is invited to or happens in your park or anything like that? Uh, no, we just, we just well, we, I mean, obviously uh, we have community events that the Idlewild public is invited to. Okay. Uh, I was trying to, uh, as, as in my capacity as newsletter editor, I was trying to celebrate the uh, um, 75th anniversary of the founding of the Idlewild Community Association this past year, but uh, we tended to be somewhat uh, blitzed by COVID, so it was very low key. I think we may have had an ice cream social. Well, consider this part of that celebration. You get to feature this, and this um, this video will be put up on YouTube on the Baltimore Architecture Foundation's YouTube channel. And so if you want to go back and look at that or share it with others um, who may have an interest, you may do so. And I thank everybody and I hope you'll come, uh, you'll join us for the uh, next virtual history two weeks from now. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.